Hey guys, welcome to day two of Ask Me Anything. Uh, so I'm live in reverse now, which means I can't actually see the screen. So if you've got any questions, just post them and I'll come to them later. If you can't see me or the audio is shit, then too bad because I can't see your comments. Uh, so today I want to talk about the five essential lending terms. I'm going to try and do it in five minutes. These are essential because it's it's... I always talk about it in every single appointment and as I go into more complex scenarios and questions, I'm going to keep referring to these terms. So if I say LBR, LMI, you don't know what that is, uh, that's what this video is basically for to give you lending basics 101 so you actually know what I'm talking about. So these are terms that banks use and obviously um, the acronyms and sometimes the words are really confusing and you don't know what they mean. So I've got some uh, notes here to help keep me on track, so hopefully I'll do it in five minutes. So when we're looking at property, whether you're buying or refinancing or anything, you've got a house here, okay? So I'm drawing this to scale. So this property has a value, okay? Value. Now the value isn't necessarily the purchase price, and it certainly isn't council rates. Always ignore the council rates valuation, it is not accurate. It's often only updated when the last property was last sold. Uh, ignore real estate valuation, and what you actually get for it on the market is also different to its value. When we're talking lending, the value is determined by the bank. They outsource the valuations to an actual um, valuation company, and then it gets picked up by one individual. So that individual then values your house. So it's down to one person's opinion what your house is worth, and the bank has to use that opinion or valuation with everything they do to assess your property. So you can't really control it, it is what it is. It's based on how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, how nice the property is, um, the area, and then they compare that to everything else in that same suburb. So if you've got an unusual property, like you've got, for example, I used to have a three bedroom unit that was renovated, and in my suburb, there were no comparisons, so it's very, very hard to get a good result. So in this case, we're going to assume we're buying something for 400000 okay? Now, any time we talk about loan amounts and how much you're borrowing, we call it like an LVR. So let's say, for example, um, well, a lot of people talk about you need 20%, right? So everything with banks is percentages. So this is 100% up here, 80% is going to be about here, right? Um, so essentially you don't just need 20%, you need 20% plus cost. So we're going to work with the numbers here. So where are we? 400, so 80,000 is 20%, so... Whoop, 320,000 is the loan. So the LVR stands for L for loan, V for value, and ratio. So we can see here that 320 divided by 400 is 80%. So anytime the bank talks about LVR, it's the percentage of comparison of what's owing versus the value. So when you're going for to purchase a property and you need to, you don't have as much deposit, your LVR changes. So, uh, what else should we look at? So, okay, so the reason why that 20% rule exists is because 80% is considered low risk. So this part here, so this is the debt. This is the debt. Your cash has gone in here. So you only owe this. Okay, still live. <laughs> um, where were we? Okay, so 20%. Uh, oh, buffer, yes. So this is considered low risk. Because your debt's here, and it's only 80% of the value. So everything with banks is worst case. What happens if you can't repay your debt? Um, so whatever reason, you lose your job, you decide to skip the country, you can't make your repayments. So what's going to happen is this loan is going to slowly increase because you're not making repayments. So it's going to have to repossess your property, and they're not going to wait on the market to get top dollar. They're going to fire sale. So they might sell it down here. Right, so this is considered low risk because there's a buffer in here, which means the bank is more likely to recover the money they lent you. 
Anytime you want to lend more than 80%, so you want to go up here to 90%, they are not in the game of losing. So what they do, like anytime there's a risk, there's a risk of crashing your car, so you take out car insurance. The risk here is to the lender losing money because of whatever reason. So they take out what's called lender's mortgage insurance. That's LMI. It does not protect you. It protects the bank in case they have to repossess your property and sell the um, sell it and make a loss. So it protects the bank, not you. The fee is based on the percentage you lend at. So the higher you go, the higher the risk and the more expensive the fee. It's also based on property price. So around this mark, if you're at 90%, you might be paying five or six grand. If you go to 95%, it might jump to 10 grand. Now, those, those numbers sound really scary. It's a horrendous amount. And a lot of people have a negative perception of LMI because they are, oh, it's a fee for nothing. My perspective on it is it's leverage. So I bought my property, my first property, when I was 19 and I had no money and back then you could borrow 97%. So I was able to get into the property market earlier and I paid LMI. Now, you pay every time you lend above 80%. So it's technically not a once off. So that same property, a couple of years later, the valuation went up. So I went back and took equity out and so I paid lenders more insurance again. And a couple of years later, the same thing. So I've actually paid lenders more insurance three times on that property. So for me, the option was pay it and get the property, pay it and get the money, or don't pay it and don't do anything. So don't look at it negatively, particularly if it's for investment, it's actually tax deductible. So there are lots of benefits and I see it more as a leverage cost. And in most cases, whatever that fee is, and then it's more insurance, you can normally borrow that as well. So you don't actually have to have the cash available for that. So let's jump down to deposit. Uh, hopefully that's sort of making sense. I'll go more into detail about these terms when I do my home buyer webinar. So leave a comment if you want to be invited to that. So deposit, deposit is cash. Doesn't always have to be cash, but basically it's your skin in the game. That's what they talk about when you are contributing. You have to contribute the percentage buffer plus fees. So here in SA, stamp duty is the biggest cost and that's 5% of the purchase price. So when you see all the ads out there, oh, you only need 5% to get a loan, it's crap. You need 5% for the property and 5% for stamp duty and then other fees. So traditionally, I always say you need 11% as a minimum. So if you're looking at this kind of purchase price, you need 44 grand. Now that's not always achievable for people. There are other ways to get into property sooner. Uh, there's guarantee strategies, which I will go through in my webinar as well. Uh, so that's deposit. Okay, servicing. Servicing is the same thing as borrowing capacity, which is basically how much can you borrow? Servicing is a term where it's the calculation the banks do to figure out how much you can borrow. And it's, this is you, okay? This is you, and you have income. Hopefully you have a job. More often than not, if you don't have a job, you're not going to get a loan. So you have income, so they want to know what you earn. They don't want to know what you earn, where you work, how long you work there. They're looking for consistency. That's the key with getting a loan is consistency. So the longer you've been somewhere, the more consistent your income is, the easier it is to get a loan. So look at your income and your outgoing. So what's coming in your pocket, what's going out your pocket. If your outgoings are massive because you have credit cards, personal loans, car loans, Where's the excess money to pay for a mortgage? There is none, right? So outgoings is your living expenses, so day-to-day, -day, so power, food, fun, all that sort of stuff, plus your liabilities, which brings us to A&L. So A&L is short for assets and liabilities. A lot of people can get confused about what's deemed an asset and what's a liability. A liability, in short, is debt, so loans. Um, it's where there's a balance and you're paying something off. So lay-by doesn't count because um, it's not actually a credit facility. So liabilities, most commonly home loan, car loan, personal loan, credit cards, which includes all the interest-free stuff. So when they look at this, when they look at credit cards, it's your limit, not your balance. They don't care how good you are at paying it off. If you have a 10 grand credit card limit and you barely use it, you have the capacity to spend 10 grand. So they'll always take that 10 grand figure into consideration. So if you want to borrow more, drop your credit card limits down. Personal loans, car loans, they don't care how good you are at paying it off. 
They don't care if you pay it off two years sooner. They care what your monthly commitment is. Doesn't matter if you have five months left on that loan, you still have that commitment today and you're committed to that monthly repayment. So that's part of your outgoings. You're committed to that, which means you don't have the extra funds to go towards the home loan. So if you have personalized car loans, I suggest you don't have them, they're rubbish, sell your car, get a shit bomb, get leftover money, put it towards your deposit. You don't need car loans and personal loans. Bad. Um, so that's the liability part of your um, uh, position. So assets. Assets uh, from a bank's perspective are things like house, car, um, superannuation, savings, shares, uh, your furniture and all your um, goods like household goods. Um, that's all considered an asset in terms of the bank's perspective. Um, obviously, technically, if you're looking from the investing world, an asset is something that brings you income, not takes income. Uh, so yeah, hopefully I've covered it. I've got no idea how long I've been. Hopefully it's under five minutes. So we've gone LBR, LMI, Servicing, Deposit, and l We discussed incomings, outgoings, and value. So more detail in the webinar, and hopefully you enjoyed. Have a good night, guys. Ah.